Enemy troop strength and landing methods. In order to gain their objectives, invaders must have at least three times the troop strength of the defenders. This fact has been amply demonstrated throughout the history of warfare in Japan and other nations. The American military had adhered to this rule in all previous actions in the Pacific. American forces invading Okinawa would thus have to have between six and ten divisions, three times our army's troop strength. The enemy would probably pick one spot to make a landing. It is rare for an invasion force to make two or more landings at a time. The enemy would secure a narrow strip of land on the coast a few kilometres in length, extending one or two kilometres inland. The superior forces of the enemy's navy and air force would fend off counter-attacks by the Japanese army, while troops on the ground unloaded munitions and made preparations to advance inland. The advance would normally be staged several days after the landing. In the event, 10th Army comprised 24 Corps, 96th, 7th and 77th Divisions and 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps, 1st and 6th Marine Divisions. The 27th Army Division was also committed, while the 2nd Marine Division remained in reserve. One also cannot discount the possibility that the enemy might stage landings at two or more different locations, or advance immediately after landing. But in any of these cases as well, the Japanese army was committed to the kind of plan that would attack and destroy the enemy immediately after landing, in a narrow strip of land on the coast. Reliability of Operation Victory the plans adopted for the decisive Battle of Okinawa were based on the policy of Imperial Headquarters to use the Navy and Air Force to crush advancing enemy forces at sea. To their way of thinking, ground defence units were needed only to mop up enemy remnants after they landed. It would be fortunate if this actually turned out to be the case. 32nd Army obviously hoped that it would. After the fall of the Marianas Line, however, 32nd Army's senior officers no longer had much faith in the fighting strength of the Navy and Air Force. We questioned whether we would stand a fighting chance against an invasion force if it landed without sustaining great damage. The ground fighting strength ratio between their forces and ours, given their heavy logistical support, could be as much as 10 to 1. With the addition of the American Pacific Fleet and its air power, the overall fighting strength was 20 or 30 to 1. Did we have a chance of successfully defending Okinawa against such a powerful enemy? For the following reasons, I felt hopeful that we could thwart the Ama'akan forces' landing scheme. The effects of bombardment by the American Navy and Air Force could be nullified by keeping our forces in underground tunnels that would withstand enemy bombs and gunfire. Against steel, the prod yukti of American industry, we would pit our earthen fortifications – the product of the sweat of our troops and the Okinawan people. The Americans might put as many as ten divisions into the field, but no more than a few could land initially. There would doubtless be confusion in the ranks, as the troops would be exposed on a narrow strip of land without fortifications. Hold up safely in our fortified areas, we could, as our chief of staff put it, laugh in the face of the enemy's bombardment, we would be able to maintain firepower and organisation and keep order in the ranks. Because our army was on the defensive, we could concentrate large-caliber artillery guns in the field. We had 400 guns of 7.5 cm bore or above. Of these, 120 guns were 15 cm or above. The firepower of these powerful guns directed at the enemy's narrow beachhead from the tunnel emplacements would have a devastating effect. In modern warfare, tanks and artillery wield greater offensive power than infantry. Unfortunately, our 32nd Army had only one regiment of light tanks. We did, however, have considerable artillery strength. With an eye on this, I devised tactics for effective bombardment of the beachhead. On the basis of these tactical concepts, I made recommendations to the Central Command for further artillery reinforcements. Stressing the necessity of unified command operation facilities, I made a strong case to headquarters and succeeded in having the 5th Artillery Group placed under direct army control. In the Pacific Islands so far, American landing forces had first secured a beachhead and then progressed step by step toward an advance a few days later. We could not discount the possibility that the enemy might stage an advance immediately after landing with numerous tank units breaking through infantry resistance and striking at artillery positions. If this happened, our army would be at a disadvantage. 
If, however, we increased the longitudinal depth of infantry tunnel positions and made substantial preparation for anti-tank warfare, the infantry lines could hold out for the two days our army would need to prepare for a counter-offensive. Given the enemy's sea and air supremacy, it would be difficult to move large fighting units through the narrow corridor of land connecting Nakagami in the southern half of the island with Shimajiri in the north. For the following reasons, I believed that this problem could be solved. The distance to be crossed was no more than 25 kilometres. Units could be moved under cover of night. Units unable to complete the move at night could adopt the procedures devised in Manchuria for troop manoeuvres under enemy-controlled skies. The 9th and 24th Divisions had been thoroughly drilled in these manoeuvres in Manchuria. Because the invasion would proceed from water to land, enemy aircraft would be based on aircraft carriers and would probably make no more than a few night air sorties. We could prepare for north-south roads for troop movements, place repair materials at those key segments most likely to be bombarded by the enemy, and construct alternate roads. Underground positions would be constructed beforehand for units to take up after manoeuvres. The 9th and 24th Divisions and artillery units would undergo drills to master these manoeuvres. Munitions would be stockpiled separately in the north and in the south. Events would prove the accuracy of Colonel Yahara's forecasts about the time and place of the Okinawa invasion, although the scale of the American attack was beyond even his cool and pessimistic reckoning. This was due largely to two factors – the success of American air power, principally the carrier sweeps of the Pacific, and the continued attrition of Japanese shipping by the US submarine force, the unsung heroes of the Pacific War. Thus, the strategic estimates for the encirclement and invasion of Japan were being outdated by the very speed of the Allied advance. As events unfolded in 1944 and 1945, Yahara's forebodings about the loss of the Marianas and the disintegration of Japanese air power were confirmed, far beyond the worst-case scenarios of the Japanese staff planners. In 1943, when the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington had approved the design for the ongoing war against Japan, the plan was to invade South China, Taiwan and ultimately the main islands of Japan, but only after a continuing series of strikes and landings at island outposts across the Pacific. This, at least, is how the war was viewed from Nimitz's headquarters at Makalapa Heights, overlooking Pearl Harbor. General MacArthur saw things differently from his vantage point. He envisioned a steady push northward through New Guinea and Borneo to the attack on the Philippines. This offensive would proceed regularly, first with the reduction of Mindanao, then Leyte, and finally the Japanese strongholds on Luzon. Events intervened, however, to speed up both timetables and, in a sense, combine them. While the steady push northward continued in the southwest Pacific area, the Central Pacific Theatre became the scene of a series of successful long-range strikes at Japanese sea power and air power. The result was the destruction or isolation of most of the beleaguered island garrisons in the Pacific. Japanese losses in the Battle of Midway had already taken away the best of Japan's well-trained carrier-based navy pilots and some of its aircraft carriers. The Battle of the Philippine Sea, which destroyed the super battleship Masashi, among others, took a fearful toll of Japanese air power. Airstrikes by the American task forces leading up to the attack on the Marianas virtually completed the job. In those engagements of June 1944, the so-called Marianas Turkey Shoot, U.S. Navy pilots took care of most of Japan's remaining carrier strength. Thenceforward, Japan's air war would be carried on by hastily trained aviators with only a few surviving carriers. The end result was the desperate strategy of the kamikaze suicide planes, which, as it happened, took a heavy toll of U.S. Navy ships in the Okinawa campaign. By July 1944, U.S. forces had secured the Japanese stronghold of Saipan, along with the adjoining islands of Tinian and Guam, the former Amer Icon possession. The attack on Leyte in October of that year bypassed Mindanao and opened the way to a move north for the final assault on Luzon. The September attack on Peleliu, which proved to be a very bloody battle indeed, was overtaken by events before it began. The island was supposed to serve as a base for aircraft in the attack on the Philippines, but with airfields on Leyte, no further bases were needed. 
Iwo Jima was attacked and captured with similar heavy losses on both sides late in November 1944. It served as a base for the B-29 aircraft, then raiding the Japanese mainland. By October, the Joint Chiefs cancelled plans to attack Taiwan. They chose Okinawa instead. The Ryukyus were closer to the Japanese main islands and presented a far more tempting and immediate target. The B-29 raids continued in 1944 with ever-growing intensity, culminating in the ghastly firebombing attacks of 1945. Less heralded, but in the end far more effective in undermining Japanese military strength, was the extraordinary success of the US submarines. In 1944, fully two and a half million tonnes of Japanese shipping was sunk by US submarines, more than the total achieved in the early years of the war. By the middle of 1945, when the Okinawa invasion began, it was hazardous for Japanese troop ships to attempt travel much outside the main islands. Indeed, US submarines had their periscopes locked on the entrance to Tokyo Bay. At Jikpoa's interrogation centre at Pearl Harbour, it was easy to project from staff requests for interrogations which way the winds were blowing. In mid-1944, I had spent a great deal of time interrogating Taiwanese seamen who had been picked up by the Navy, with a view to an invasion there. By the time I returned from the Palau operation with some 250 Japanese prisoners of war and 300 Korean conscript labourers in tow, Taiwan was a dead issue. It was clear that we were after Okinawa and then the main islands. Most of our interrogation at that time centred on strategic targets in Japan, but when we received orders to board Navy transports in early 1945, heading west and north with only a stop at Leyte on the way, it was quite clear where our target lay. By late summer, as we have seen, the fall of the Marianas and lost carrier battles west of the islands had convinced Imperial headquarters that Okinawa must be reinforced. The 62nd Division, a battle-wise unit from China, was ticketed for the island as well as the 24th, which had served in Manchuria. The bulk of the troops from the new 44th Independent Mixed Brigade were lost on June 29, 1944, when a US submarine torpedoed their transport. Almost 5,000 men were killed in that disaster. Worse was yet to come. On October 10, 1944, a week after Nimitz's staff had finally decided to bypass Taiwan and go for the Ryukyus, Waves of carrier-based aircraft from Task Force 58 gave Okinawa its first brutal taste of war. The capital city of Naha was almost destroyed. Since the US airstrike's principal target was the harbour there, great quantities of munitions went up in flaming explosions. The rest of the island was not spared. Two airfields were heavily damaged and more than 80 Japanese aircraft destroyed on the ground. The civilian toll was worse. More than 1,000 Okinawan men, women and children lost their lives, far worse than the military casualties, and a sad foretaste of the tragedy to come. There was some fortuitous irony in the timing of the raid. The night before, at a banquet in Naha, Lieutenant General Cho had boastfully told his audience that the Okinawa battle would result in certain victory for Japan. He did nothing to dispel the impression that Imperial Headquarters' grand strategy lay in luring American air and sea power into a death trap, only to be finished off by waves of aircraft from the mainland and the combined fleet, while 32nd Army eliminated those American troops unfortunate enough to reach the beachhead. Perhaps he believed it, the next morning the very restaurant where he had made his claims was a smoking ruin. These blows from the Americans were now compounded by a major strategic error, on the part of Imperial Headquarters in Tokyo. Worried about the progress of US forces in the Philippines, Tokyo ordered the entire 9th Division shipped out of Okinawa to the Philippines via Taiwan. The 25,000 men who left in December represented the cream of the Okinawan Defence Force. They were the very people whom Cho and Yahara had counted on to fight off the Americans from heavily fortified defences along the west coast beaches. Thus, Several months before the American landing on April 1, 1945, Yahara had been forced into a change in plans. There would now be no attempt to repulse the Americans at the beachhead because there were too few troops. On the contrary, while a few units were left to act as guerrilla irritants in the northern two-thirds of the island, the main force of 32nd Army was to be concentrated in the southern third, 
behind several heavily fortified lines north of army headquarters at Shuri Castle. The battle was to be, as Yahara frequently wrote, a jikyusen, a war of attrition. For this, his preparations were impressive. Almost all of the Japanese artillery strength in the Ryukyus, there were two divisions on Miyakojima and Ishigakijima. We must remember were concentrated on Okinawa and placed under General Wada's 5th Artillery Group. Their guns would bolster an elaborate system of interlocking defences. Dugouts and pillboxes dotted the honeycombed caves of the area and provided a kind of interlocking defence. The airfields at Yomitan and Kadena would be abandoned to the Americans. If others at 32nd Army Headquarters still hoped for a massive surge of avenging aircraft and paratroopers from the mainland, Yahara had few illusions on that score. As he saw it, the war in Okinawa would be fought on the ground. It would consist of a bitter yard by yard defence of the island. Ultimate defeat was inevitable, given the weight of American sea, air and land power. But Yahara's aim was to delay the reduction of the island fortress for as long as possible. 32nd Army's persistence would in turn gain time for the Japanese armed forces to build up their resources against what all felt would be a coming invasion of the main islands. At the close of Easter week, on April 6th and 7, Imperial headquarters launched its long-promised two-pronged attack on the American fleet off Okinawa. Almost 700 aircraft took off from bases in Kyushu and Taiwan in an effort to destroy the US 5th Fleet. Most were shot down. The damage they did was considerable. Some eight destroyers and smaller ships were sunk and ten damaged. But it was nothing like the 60 warships that Japan's Imperial headquarters announced had been sunk. Some of the airplanes were kamikaze, piloted by officers of the Tokotai, the special attack force of suicide fighters, who pledged to crash their airplanes into enemy ships in acts of self-immolation. There would be more of these kamikazes later, though not in such great force. The suicide attacks were responsible for the highest rate of US naval casualties in World War II. Also, on April 6th and 7, the super battleship Yamato, the world's largest, made its fateful sortie south from Kyushu in a desperate effort to reach the American fleet offshore, where Yamato's 18-inch guns could be expected to wreak heavy damage. It was a suicide mission, all acknowledged this, from Vice Admiral Seichi Ito to the lowest ensign in the wardroom. The Yamato had been given only enough fuel for a one-way trip. The huge, sleek, oddly graceful ship raced south through the Bungo Straits toward the Ryukyus at flank speed. In addition to having the world's heaviest naval guns, the Yamato also was the world's fastest battleship. But for its last run, Imperial headquarters could provide it no air cover whatsoever. The Yamato was attacked by swarms of American carrier aircraft from Task Force 58 on April 6th. She finally sank on the morning of the 7th, after having taken nine torpedoes and several bomb hits. The cruiser Yahagi and most of the destroyers in the accompanying screen were lost as well. Almost the entire crew perished, with only 200 survivors. As Ensign Mitsuru Yoshida reported, in what later became a best-selling book in Japan, the desolate decks were reduced to shambles, with nothing but cracked and twisted steel plates remaining. The big guns were inoperable because of the gathering list, and only a few rapid-fire guns were intact. As though awaiting this moment, the enemy came plunging through the clouds to deliver the coup de grace. It was impossible to evade. I could hear the captain vainly shouting, Hold on, men! Hold on, men! It was an ironic commentary on the war's changing fortunes. Three years later, the Yamato had met the same fate dealt out to the British battle. Ship HMS Prince of Wales and the battlecruiser HMS Repulse, when they were sunk by Japanese carrier aircraft off the Malay coast in early 1942. On the land, however, the fighting told a different story. Five days after the successful landing, the two lead divisions of US-24 Corps, soon followed by the 1st Marine Division, ran into the heavily fortified Japanese line. For the next two weeks, the war settled down to the most bitter, ruthless kind of hand-to-hand -hand fighting, as GLIS and Marines desperately tried to claw their way up heavily defended rocky escarpments. The advancing troops were exposed not merely to constant mortar, machine gun and rifle fire, but they took a pounding from General Wada's artillery. It was the worst fighting of the Pacific War. 
its sustained intensity surpassing even the brutal combat of Tarawa, Peleliu and Iwo Jima. The Yamato, like its sister ship, the Musashi, displaced 70,000 tonnes and mounted a main battery of nine 18.1-inch guns. Built in defiance of the pre-war Washington Naval Treaty regulations, they were, as Japanese chief petty officers were wont to say, the biggest 16-inch guns in the Navy. The southern third of Okinawa proved to be ideal terrain for Colonel Yahara's war of attrition, wooded, hilly and easily honeycombed with caves and dugouts. North of the headquarters on Mount Shuri, several jagged lines of ridges and rocky escarpments stretched on east-west lines across the narrowed waste of the island. Japan's 32nd Army had spent the greater part of a year turning them into formidable nests of interlocking pillboxes and firing positions. Connected by a network of caves and passageways inside the hills, their positioning enabled defenders to shift their strength constantly in response to attack. The infantrymen of 32nd Army rarely built their entrenchments on hill crests. Instead, in time-honoured Japanese military tradition, they dug in on the reverse slopes. When US troops advanced to the top of a hill, thinking they had it almost secured, they would be met by a withering fire from just below the crest line. A little more than a week after the easy landings, General John Hodge's 24th Corps ran into serious trouble. The Kakazu Ridge was merely the first of Ushijima's heavily entrenched strongpoints, but it brought the US Army's 96th Division up against the sort of desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting that would characterise the Okinawa land battle. Carefully concealed anti-tank guns and mortars seemed anchored into the terrain. Their intense fire partly nullified the considerable firepower of the tanks advancing with the American infantry. While Marine and Army units swept north to capture Lajima, the offshore airfield island, and occupy most of Kunigami in the north of the main island, things were getting stickier in the south. The American command would later rule out a flanking amphibious landing on the south coast because of logistical difficulties, but operation timetables were being altered to bring the two marine divisions of 3rd Amphibious Corps to join 24 Corps in what promised to be a gruelling and costly attempt to breach 32nd Army's Shuri Line. It was at this point, just when Yahara's war of attrition was working well, that the Chief of Staff had his first outburst of samurai offensive fever. It was time, Cho argued, to strike back, unduly encouraged, perhaps, by Imperial Headquarters' glowing but hugely inflated accounts of Air Force successes against US fleet units offshore, Cho persuaded Ushijima to launch a counterattack. It was to be a night assault, in the best Japanese army tradition. Crack battalions of both the 62nd and 24th Divisions were to jump off on April 12, infiltrate the American positions, and attack them from the rear. Infiltration tactics were preferred so that large concentrations of advancing troops would not furnish obvious targets to US Navy units waiting offshore for just such a possibility. Once Japanese units had penetrated the American lines on a broad scale, 10th Army's advantages of air power and offshore firepower would be largely negated, for American and Japanese units would be hopelessly entangled. The infiltrating troops had only to sever supply lines and generally cause confusion in 10th Army's rear areas. Then Ushijima's frontline troops could come out of their entrenchments and attack. In vain, Yahara argued that this kind of offensive effort would only waste men. Against a determined and superior enemy, it was bound to fail. But Cho swept his superior and the divisional generals along with him. Here, they agreed... The vaunted Japanese offensive spirit would obviously overcome those foreigners with all their machines. All Yahara succeeded in doing was to cut down the number of battalions committed. In the event, the attack failed. Although some of the infiltrators temporarily gained their objectives, one battalion actually penetrating a mile behind the American lines, they were all mopped up after hard fighting. The net loss amounted to almost four battalions, which 32nd Army could ill afford, some amphibious landings had also been planned for April 12. Ship Ping engineer units were to attack the US West Coast beachhead from the rear. They were discovered, however, and destroyed. Earlier, a week before the April 1st landing, US units had successfully occupied the Karama Islands just west of Okinawa. Japanese planners had hoped to use these islands to launch a swarm of suicide boats in attacks on the American transports, 
With the failure of the April 12 landings, all such efforts came to an end. Back in their entrenchments, however, the infantrymen of 32nd Army remained as formidable as ever. From the huge cave headquarters beneath Mount Shuri, where they were secure from any amount of aerial or naval bombardment, Yahara and his staff assistants continued to deploy their defenders. For the Americans, each strongpoint received its local nickname, Conical Ridge, Flat Top Hill, Chocolate Drop, Tombstone Ridge, and so on. Each involved sustained, bloody, seesawing advances and retreats, to the point where progress could be measured only in yards. Militarily speaking, Yahara was satisfied. In no other Pacific Island operation had the Japanese side held out so long and with such relative success against superior force. But holding operations were not what a fire-eater like Isamu Cho had joined the army for. In a second heatedly argued conference, Cho once more talked the commanding general into ordering a general counter-attack. This time the 24th Division, less heavily engaged than the badly bruised 62nd, would take the lead. Before dawn on May 4th, after the heaviest Japanese artillery bombardment of the campaign, the 24th Division and the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade moved up to the attack in what Cho hoped would lead to a decisive battle. But no breakthrough was achieved. Under attack, the American units rallied, and the Japanese gained almost no ground. Indeed, out of their Ent trenchments, they were veritable sitting ducks for 10th Army's big guns. Cho was disheartened and chastened. Ushijima, for his part, now regretted yielding to his chief of staff's persuasion. The attack had gained nothing and had cost him 5,000 men. Although Cho had once again been impressed at the prospect of a simultaneous assault by the Air Force, that too had failed. It was at this point that the commanding general sent for his senior staff officer. Here we resume Yahara's own narrative at six o'clock in the evening of May 5th. I was sitting quietly at my desk when Lieutenant General Ushijima, our commanding officer, sent for me. I walked woodenly as far as the adjoining office of the chief of staff and stopped with a silent salute. When Ushijima spotted me, he shouted, Come on in, Colonel Yahara, senior staff officer, entering his office. I was tense, dreading what he might say. Would he order a final charge? Would this be the end? As usual, the commander-in-chief was sitting cross-legged on the worn tatami floor. I stood at attention. He looked at me pensively and then spoke softly. Colonel Yahara, as you predicted, this offensive has been a total failure. Your judgment was correct. You must have been frustrated from the start of this battle, because I did not use your talents and skill wisely. Now I am determined to stop this offensive, meaningless suicide is not what I want. When I left Tokyo, both War Minister Umezu and Army Chief of Staff Anami urged me not to be hasty in ordering a last suicidal charge. Now our main force is largely spent, but some of our fighting strength is left, and we are getting strong support from the Islanders. With these we will fight to the southernmost hill, to the last square inch of land, and to the last man. I am ready to fight but from now on I leave everything up to you. My instructions to you are to do whatever you feel is necessary. What an outrageous thing for Ushijima to say, now that our forces were exhausted. He finally recognised what I had been advocating from the start of the Okinawa battle. It was now too late to accomplish anything. I was not only frustrated, I was furious. Still, I appreciated his sincerity and the fact that he could admit the truth. I could feel his remorse about our situation. Up to now, General Ushijima had left major decisions to the Chief of Staff, the recently promoted Lieutenant General Cho and his subordinates. The outcome was inevitable, and I must acknowledge certain unpleasant facts. He was not alone to blame. I had not performed to the best of my ability. Since I truly believed in my own strategic plan, I should have stuck to that belief and staked my life on it. I thought I had done my best, but I regretted that so many things were left undone. I was aware that General Cho, sitting next door, could overhear every word of our conversation. I could only imagine his feelings. When he ordered the May 4th offensive, he had said that we would all die together. General Cho had staked his life on this offensive, and it was a complete failure. I felt sorry for him, but the results had been predictable. Until this offensive, Cho had been responsible for our military decisions, but now General Ushijima was leaving everything up to me. 
Naturally, this was discouraging to Cho, but he understood the situation. He even said jokingly to me, Hey, Yahara, when will it be okay for me to commit Harakiri? Is this a good time? He not only had assumed responsibility for the failed offensive, but now had lost all hope for success in any further operations. Some accounts of the battle for Okinawa have made much of General Ushijima's overruling me at the start of the offensive, but they overlook the fact that when the offensive failed, he left all decision-making to me. It is ridiculous to have told only half the truth. I feel it is now my duty to set the record straight. With the defeat of our offensive, there was no miracle medicine to heal the critical wounds of the May 4th debacle, but to afford at least temporary relief, I immediately put into effect my original plan of action, as follows. Trusting to the courage of each unit, our forces would continue to punish the enemy where possible, while conserving strength to him, prove our chances in a continuing war of attrition. The 24th Division would at once cancel its offensive, return to its original entrenchments, and force the enemy to shed his blood. The 44th Independent Mixed Brigade would return to Sugarloaf Hill, Amekudai, immediately, and prepare to assist the 62nd Division in its operations. The 6th Special Regiment would serve under the command of the 44th Brigade, wherever located. The 62nd Division would continue its present assignment. The Army Artillery Group would cooperate closely with the front. Line Divisions Ammunition supplies would be conserved in a corps, dance with our strategic war of attrition. The naval base forces would continue their present duty, our intelligence officer Yakumaru, who had proposed counter-landings on both coasts of Okinawa, was thoroughly sombre and depressed. His counter-attacking units had been lost. Major Tadao Miyake, our logistics officer, quite a cynical fellow, said to him, so all your China experience was for naught. Young, aggressive staff officers are not to blame, however, for such military failures. Their training has taught them to rely instinctively on the sheer offensive. Young blood cannot just wait silently for a suicidal death charge. To myself, I summarised the results of the May 4th counter-offensive in this way. The fighting strength of the 24th Division was down to one-third of its original strength. The artillery group's ammunition supply was almost exhausted. Sunano, a senior officer of the group, proposed limiting each gun to 10 rounds per day so that supplies might last to the end of May. Two shipping engineer regiments and many naval suicide squadrons had been totally annihilated. During the two-day counter-offensive, our forces suffered the loss of 5,000 seasoned soldiers, killed and wounded. Without the counter-offensive, the 24th Division, the Mixed Brigade and the 62nd Division, in cooperation with the artillery group, could have been well prepared for defence. We were well aware of the coming decisive battle for mainland Japan. At the time we never dreamed of surrender by August 15, it was now too late to con Cider. But if we had not gone on the counter-offensive, and instead remained in our well-prepared fortifications, reinforced by our powerful artillery, we could have prolonged the Okinawa battle for another month and saved thousands of lives. Failure of the counter Offensive forced the mixed brigade to draw back to Sugarloaf Hill, Amikudai, where they were doomed to defeat. The 24th Division was similarly handicapped, while our artillery activity was restricted to sporadic firing. The counter-offensive had at first eased the pressure along the 62nd Division's front, but its failure placed them in even greater danger. R.I., the prefectural police chief, visited our headquarters and confirmed that everyone on the island military and civilian had suffered a loss of morale as a result of our failed counter-offensive. The one possible benefit of this disaster was that it might make the enemy more cautious about our future course of action. Busy as I was with the daily battle situation, I tried very hard to keep up with the news of other war developments, the homeland, and the general world situation. On Okinawa, we were very conscious of our heavy responsibility in the glaring light of world attention. I continued to hope that the fate of our army would improve with each new outside development. At the start of the war, Domain News Service had provided accurate world news reports, but as time passed, they did not cover world news at all. Toward the end, we had to rely on the army radio for outside news. I encouraged our intelligence officers to pull together better coverage of world news, 
but they were too busy with day-to-day -day operations to gather useful outside reports. In early April 1945, seemingly authoritative information came from one of the secret special service organization units in Harbin, saying that if our air attacks on the US Navy could continue for another 10 days, the enemy would be forced to break off operations on Okinawa. This lifted our spirits and led us to believe that we might again succeed in regaining enemy-occupied territory. Then came the glorious news, for us on April 12, that President Roosevelt was dead. The staff officers were ecstatic. Many seemed convinced that we would now surely win the war. Meanwhile, in the homeland, the Koiso cabinet was replaced by the Suzuki cabinet. There was no explanation of this change, and soldiers did not pay much attention to it. I felt myself that the ease with which the enemy had landed on Okinawa, as well as the urgent insistence from Imperial headquarters that we counter-attack, had caused some political disorder. I also guessed that the collapse of Nazi Germany and developments in Europe were inducing the new cabinet to end the war. If we were to sue for peace, I wanted it to happen before many more thousands of soldiers and civilians had to make the supreme sacrifice. After the war, I read a newspaper article by former Prime Minister Suzuki, in which he suggested that if Japanese soldiers in Okinawa could have pushed the enemy into the sea, it would have been a propitious moment for Japan to ask for peace. I was infuriated. He knew nothing about the battle situation on Okinawa. His sources of information were not aware of the situation there. He must have actually believed that an all-out air offensive was the solution. The fact is that we never had a chance for victory on Okinawa. Months before the enemy invasion, General Sugiyama informed Colonel Takushiro Hattori, the operations chief at General Headquarters, that he could not bear responsibility for the defence of Okinawa. Just three months before the Okinawa battle started, the High Command moved our powerful 9th Division to Taiwan and other forces to the Philippines. At that time, nonetheless, we reported our intention to fight on the beaches of Okinawa when the enemy landed at Kadena. Imperial headquarters' response was to say, we will have the decisive battle on Japan proper. Okinawa is merely a frontline action. Yet when battle was joined on Okinawa, the emperor solemnly declared that its outcome would deter, mine the nation's future. If he truly believed that, why did he not send the forces needed for the defence of Okinawa? And why had he referred to us as merely a frontline action, I would not have resented a firm decision simply to wage the final battle on mainland Japan. Once the Okinawa battle began, however, such a goal was contradicted by forcing our frontline unit to fight the decisive battle and then expecting us to win. It was naive for anyone to believe that Okinawa was an excuse for ending the war. Since October 1944, not a single person from Imperial headquarters had come to Okinawa or even given us a word of encouragement. Never once did any individual speak to me concerning the defence of the Ryukyu Islands, even though I was the senior staff operations officer. Instead, they merely sent me documents and messages, nothing more. From the very start of the Okinawa battle, we were out of real touch with Imperial headquarters. Our fighting men made cynical and sarcastic remarks such as, headquarters people will never come to Okinawa because Tsuji Town, Naha's red light district was burned down in the air raids last October, or they are afraid of enemy submarines and airplanes. What a contrast to the leaders of enemy countries, such as President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill, who appeared in combat areas to speak words of encouragement to their fighting men. On April 26, Prime Minister Suzuki made a special radio speech to encourage the troops and civilians on Okinawa, but I missed the broadcast. In mid-May came news of Germany's capitulation. We now realised that we were doomed. It was nonsense to continue the war in this corner of the Pacific after our only real ally had collapsed. A man may ruin himself as a matter of pride to save face. He should not, however, jeopardise his nation for such a reason. A nation should never be sacrificed for the sake of its leaders. Japan's leaders got us involved in the China incident out of a sense of self-preservation. They started that war to preserve their own power, status and honour. Who would not despair at knowing that soldiers were dying in the interests of such leaders? When our May 4th counter-offensive was terminated, all troops returned to their original positions. General Ushijima, his staff and the troops were thoroughly discouraged, 
yet overall there was a strange sense of relief. Then one day a liaison officer brought me an order from Generals Ushijima and Cho, saying that Staff Officer Major Jin, an aviator, was going to Tokyo. Puzzled by this surprising decision, I asked what it meant and was told, we are sending him to Imperial Headquarters to request approval for our air forces to attack the enemy fleet in strength, force their withdrawal and thus end the Okinawa operations. At first glance this might have seemed like a brilliant move to spare us military losses, yet every effort was already being made to destroy enemy shipping from the air. The flyers were already claiming that they were the main strength in this operation, with 32nd Army being merely a bunch of stagehands. Our Tokotai special suicide, kamikaze units, had been striking almost daily, but enemy air strength remained far superior to ours. As a matter of fact, air power was never a prime factor in the battle for Okinawa. The enemy had established a firm position ashore by landing six army and marine divisions. We knew that our forces were attacking them bravely, but we needed much more than bravery. Furthermore, it was ridiculous to think that the enemy would withdraw from this operation. Japan was frantically preparing for a final decisive battle on the home islands, leaving Okinawa to face a totally hopeless situation. From the beginning, I had insisted that our proper strategy was to hold the enemy as long as possible, drain off his troops and supplies, and thus contribute our utmost to the final decisive battle for Japan proper. Since it was foolish even to dream of victory here in Okinawa, I disagreed with the idea of sending Major Jin to Tokyo. From the strategic point of view, I was against it. As a tactical matter, I certainly agreed that our suicide planes should destroy as much enemy shipping as possible, but this was no more than a hope. The order for Jin's mission was already signed and sealed. There was no way for me to stop it. The problem was how to get Jin out of Okinawa. The two possible avenues were the sea and sky, but the powerful enemy forces were serious obstacles, and we would need a miracle to overcome them. The plan was for Jin to go south to Mabuni and take a seaplane to Tokyo. Jin and I had completely different military points of view. He naturally favoured the use of air power. I was opposed to placing heavy emphasis on it. If he somehow managed to reach Imperial headquarters, how would he present my views of the Okinawa operation? I was deeply concerned that he might misconstrue or even ignore them. If that happened, my position would be lost forever. I thought about this as I asked him to carry a notebook to my father in Tokyo. Shortly before Major Jin's departure, we were diverted by a minor force. Lieutenant Moriwaki of the Mixed Brigade approached Jin, saluted him and startled him by saying, Sir, will you please teach me how to fly an airplane, any plane, even an enemy one will do, I want to fly myself home. I understood Moriwaki's feelings, an instructor at the infantry school. He had been assigned to Okinawa for only temporary duty, to accompany Major Kiyoso, an anti-tank specialist. Unfortunately for Moriwaki, he was caught by the enemy invasion and was going to be in combat whether he wanted to or not. When he heard that Jin was leaving, he made his desperate plea. In a way I was responsible for his being here, I had asked headquarters for an anti-tank expert to help us work out tactics against enemy tanks. The two officers, once they arrived, seemed fated to share our destiny. Some time later we learned that Moriwaki was ordered out of Okinawa, I hope he made it, about the time that Major Jin left our underground headquarters for Tokyo. I ordered all women occupants nurses, as well as comfort girls, to leave the cave and go south. After the failure of our May 4th offensive, Conditions in the caves had become miserable. Sanitation facilities had broken down. Food was in short supply. Morale was deteriorating. It seemed certain that everyone in the headquarters cave would die in battle. I wanted to get the women out of this depressing situation and send them to rear areas where they could care for wounded soldiers. When I ordered their retreat to the south, they objected violently. You order us out, they cried, because you think of us only as women. We are no longer just women, we are soldiers, and we wish to die with you. Despite their loyal objections, they had to go. We gave them a few small mementos. General Cho contributed his precious teapot. The oppression of the cave was eased somewhat as we saw them safely on their way south and wished them luck. Carrying heavy bags on their backs, they disappeared into the Hantagawa Valley on May 10th. Enemy artillery fire diminished as the sun began to set.